Okay, everybody. Um, this is the third podcast in our lab test review series, and what we're going to be talking about today are tissues. Um, we begin, of course, with the, uh, the cautionary warning. Do not use this as a substitute for either attending biosis or coming to lab and actually doing the exercises. Otherwise, your performance in the lab practicals will suffer. This is just simply meant to augment um, your understanding of the material. So we begin with histology, and in general, histology is the study of tissues, their appearance, their properties, and their roles, and also um, what they look like when they're um, in a disease state. That's a particular type of a histology called pathohistology. But we're going to be looking today at healthy tissues, and we'll begin with a couple of tissues shown here. Now, one of the things that you want to understand about um, tissue types in general is that the shapes that they have and the, the properties that they exhibit are due to their role that they play in the human body. So, what we're looking at here is epithelial tissue. Now, what is the um, overriding characteristic of epithelial tissue? And that is um, a lot of cells held very tightly together um, by uh, junctions that don't allow um, molecules to pass between cells. Uh, they tend to form coverings. Uh, they can be involved in secretion and absorption and protection. Uh, some epithelial tissue is vascular, some is avascular, depends on the type of epithelial tissue we look at. And there are different classes of epithelial tissue. Epithelial tissue um, can exist in a single layer, in which case it's termed simple. It can exist in more than one layer, in which case it's termed stratified. Or it can appear under the microscope to be more than one layer, when it's actually a single layer of cells with some cells shorter than the others. And in that, in that case, it's called pseudostratified. Epithelial tissue can be vascular or avascular. Vascular epithelial tissue has blood vessels in it. Avascular epithelial tissue lacks blood vessels. And epithelial tissue can sometimes exhibit um, extensions on one or both ends of the cell membrane. Uh, for instance, some epithelial tissue is ciliated, meaning it has small hair-like projections that uh, protrude off the apical surface. Now, you might think, okay, wait a minute, what's the apical surface of epithelial tissue? And that's going to be the surface that's closest to um, the hollow chamber of an organ or the external surface of an organ. Basically, it's the free end of the cell. The other end of the cell is uh, generally attached either to other cells or to uh, extracellular matrix, such as basement membrane, or to connective tissue. So um, what we're looking at here is an example of epithelial tissue. We're asked to identify this tissue uh, as indicated by the arrows. And what you should notice is that there's a single layer of tissue. Okay, You can see a single layer here. Another single layer here. Okay, this is also single layer tissue, and it's as wide as it is tall as it is thick, and so um, that's a, a shape that we call cuboidal. Okay, so this is simple cuboidal epithelium. Where is this type of tissue found in the body? Well, this happens to be a slide taken from kidney tubules, and kidney tubules are part of the blood cleansing apparatus that we know as the urinary system. The kidney tubules in particular uh, attempt to separate the beneficial components of blood plasma from the waste products of blood plasma. Uh, the waste products eventually find their way into the filtrate which eventually becomes the urine. Okay, So this is a type of tissue that's very good at secretion and absorption. Okay, This is a typical slide that you might take through, oh, say, the, uh, the cortex or the medulla of a kidney. Okay. Um, what functions are performed by this type of tissue and its secretion and absorption? 
What is secretion and absorption? Let's just to be clear. Secretion is the production of a product inside the cell which is inactively transported outside the cell. And there's several methods by which that can occur. That can occur via exocytosis. That can also occur, occur by uh, active transport. And both these processes require ATP in order to operate. Um, active transport generally involves the use of pumps, which are membrane proteins that use ATP as a driving force to move that particular component from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell, whereas exocytosis involves the enclosure of a cell product inside a vesicle, a membrane-enclosed vesicle in the cell, which then fuses with the cell membrane and the product is then released. The vesicle is then recovered and reused. Absorption is sort of the reverse. In absorption, we transport something from the outside of the cell inside the cell, and um, that can happen via endocytosis, or it can happen through active transport. In endocytosis, we take an extracellular product, we enclose it in a vesicle, that vesicle is then transported inside the cell, and then is either used or uh, broken down, or sometimes transported to the opposite end of the cell where it's secreted. And um, active absorption is a type of active transport that involves a pump that works from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. So we bring something from the outside to the inside, regardless of its concentration. Other um, um, processes that happen in this type of tissue include diffusion. Okay, Now diffusion, I, I kind of put apart in a separate category because diffusion is a type of passive transport and sometimes it involves protein carriers but often it does not and diffusion um, can apply either to water in which case we refer to it as osmosis or it can refer to the movement of substances down their concentration gradient from where they're most concentrated to where they're least concentrated in any case this doesn't involve an input of energy this happens naturally and eventually what will occur is that um, the substance will reach an equilibrium where the rate at which the substance leaves the cell is equal to the rate at which the substance enters the cell. Um, facilitated diffusion requires the use of protein channels because the molecules are too big to go straight through the membrane where a simple diffusion um, can go straight through the phospholipid bilayer without a protein assist. Okay, is this tissue avascular or vascular? And the, and the answer is this particular tissue is vascular. Kidney tubules are in close proximity to capillaries because they engage in a lot of secretion and absorption with the blood. As a result, um, they don't want to be too far away from the circulatory system. So in this case, we're looking at vascular tissue. Okay, next tissue. What are we looking at here? This is compact bone. Okay, compact bone is arranged in structural units called osteons. The, these are these large circular arrangements of tissue that you see here. Um, there's a central or Volkmann's canal that pierces the middle of the osteon and then these concentric lamellae that encircle it um, all the way out to the end of the osteon. And then what you'll see interspersed between the lamellae are these little dark pits. Okay, And what these little dark pits are are little chambers called lacunae that contain bone cells called osteocytes. Okay, now osteo means of or pertaining to bone, site means cell. Okay, and you can see tiny little dark extensions um, protruding from the osteocytes, and those are um, essentially uh, connections between adjacent osteocytes so that they can exchange. Um, nutrients and waste products, the little um, indentations in the lamellae that allow these cytoplasmic extensions uh, to reach across the lamellae and allow cellular contact are called canaliculi. That's, um, that, that's Italian for little canal. Okay, And so this is the way compact bone is built. Basically the, the osteocytes lay down the calcified matrix all around them until they're trapped inside the matrix and they can't move anymore. And so they have to get their blood supply from canals that run both vertically and horizontally through the compact bone that's supplying oxygen and nutrients. 
and then uh, by transferring um, those molecules to their neighbors across the way in the lamellae. So bone is living tissue, um, make no mistake about it. Um, another thing to note about bone, compact bone, is that there's a considerable amount of protein in the lamellae. Okay? And the major protein in bone is collagen, and um, the collagen in each of these concentric lamellae has an alternating orientation to lend strength to the entire um, structural unit. And what this does is this allows the bone to be both resistant to compression because of the calcium phosphate salts, but also resistant to twisting force. So this is very much the way, um, for instance, that concrete buildings are built, sidewalks are poured, or similar to the way that fiberglass is made. You've got two different types of structural material, and they both have their own um, benefits to the overall structure. Where is this uh, type of tissue found? It's found on the outer surface of bone. Deep to compact bone is spongy bone, which is similar in appearance, but it has a lot more empty space in between the osteocytes and the matrix, and what that does is it lightens the bone considerably. And then in the deepest part of the bone is uh, an area that we call um, this, the, um, the, the marrow cavity. Okay? Um, in adults, the heads of the femur, the hips, the ribs, the scapula, the clavicle, all are filled with red marrow in this cavity, which makes blood. And the long bones, such as the, uh, the femur and the humerus, the radius and the ulna and so forth, are filled with yellow marrow, which is primarily adipose tissue. Okay, so we see several roles for bone here. Bone is a part of a super class of tissues called connective tissue. And the major um, distinguishing feature of connective tissue is that there are very few cells compared with the extracellular matrix. Okay, and um, anytime you see a slide where you see a whole lot of extracellular stuff and not very many cells, you can immediately think connective tissue. Connective tissue can be solid or liquid, and we'll see a couple of liquid connective tissues a little later on in the course, um, but this is a, a perfect example of a type of connective tissue, solid connective tissue. So this is found on the outer surfaces of bones. Uh, what functions are performed by this tissue? It provides support for the body's soft tissues. It protects our vital organs. If you think about the skeletal system, your brain is housed inside your cranium. Your heart and lungs are housed inside your bony thorax. And um, your spinal cord is housed inside your vertebral column. And so this lends um, protection to a lot of organs that are vital for our survival. Um, it's also important for mineral storage. A lot of uh, minerals are stored in bone, calcium, phosphate, iodine. Um, and also, um, the skeletal system in general allows us to move uh, at structures called joints, which fall into three categories. Amphiarthroses, which are slightly movable joints, which are generally bound by cartilage. Diarthroses, which are freely movable joints that feature a joint capsule and synovial fluid and articular cartilage. Examples of the uh, diarthrotic joints include your knees, your fingers, your elbow, and so forth. And then synarthrotic joints, which are fusions of bone held together by fibers, and um, they basically do not move. Uh, the cell at the tip of, an arrow, uh, tip of the arrow is called an osteocyte. This is one of three types of bone cells that you'll find if you open up um, compact bone osteocytes are essentially osteoblasts that have become trapped in extracellular matrix. The osteoblasts are the bone builders. Okay, so you can think B for blast, B for bone builder. The osteoclasts are the bone dissolvers. And they all come from a special type of cell called an osteoprogenitor. Okay, and um, most of these cells are born in the membrane that surrounds the bone, which is called the periosteum. Okay, moving on. What kind of tissue is this? This is adipose tissue. We know this better as fat. Um, where is this tissue found in the body? It's found around organs. It's found under the skin. Uh, what does it do? It insulates and protects our organs and serves as a major fuel source. And the type of cell shown at the tip of the arrow is called an adipocyte, okay? Adipo meaning of or pertaining to fat. 
sight meaning cell. Okay, so this is our body's pantry. This is our source of nutrients between meals. Um, if we didn't have the ability to store fat um, as a fuel, it'd be very difficult for us to um, keep enough calories on hand to run the body. We've been evolutionarily selected to store fat. Um, back in the day when we didn't have modern conveniences, uh, we ate very irregular meals. You might only eat once or twice a year in some cases, and if you didn't have the ability to store fat to make it between meals, you wouldn't last um, until the next time you were able to find nourishment. So this is basically in our genes. So this is one of the reasons why it's very difficult for us to uh, lose weight. Our body has a tendency to try and store fat whenever it can. Okay, another type of tissue here. This is simple squamous epithelium. Remember I told you that epithelial tissue uh, comes in several flavors. This tissue is simple because it's a single layer. I'm tracing here the squamous epithelium. Okay. Um, it's squamous because it is flat like a pancake. Okay, so simple one layer, squamous, flat like a pancake. The dark areas here are the nuclei of the cell that contain the DNA. Where is this tissue found? This is actually a slide of a glomerulus uh, inside a Bowman's capsule. Okay, uh, the simple squamous epithelium is this um, parietal endothelial layer that lines the inside of the Bowman's capsule, and it, the functions here are diffusion and filtration. Okay, over here uh, you're looking at lung tissue, and it's the same basic setup: simple squamous epithelium designs um, is exclusively for diffusion and filtration. The advantage, of course, here is that it's easy for substances to move in and out uh, of these layers because they are so thin. This is also an example of a vascular epithelial tissue. There are a lot of blood vessels nearby, uh, and the reason for this is that the exchange with the circulatory system uh, requires that the tissue be near the circulatory system, and the result then is an ease of exchange between the tissue and the blood that runs through the uh, the uh, capillaries, the arteries, and the veins. Okay, so um, moving on, this is another type of connective tissue. Uh, this is hyaline cartilage. Okay, the cells that uh, produce hyaline cartilage are called chondrocytes. Chondro means cartilage, site means cell. I'll point to some of them here. You can see the chondrocytes here and the hyaline cartilage. And the extracellular matrix all through here, okay, which is uh, primarily with what we call ground substance. But again, this is connective tissue, and the hallmark of connective tissue is very few cells and a lot of extracellular stuff, and that's what you see in both of these slides. Where is this tissue found in the body? Um, it's found in the trachea, the epiglottis. It's found in the articular cartilage at the ends of long bones. It's found at the tip of the nose and in the ears. Um, what, does, uh, what does it do? It supports and reinforces and cushions uh, components of the body. It also resists compression. So it has a lot of properties in common with uh, skeletal tissue, with bone. The name that is applied to the cavity that's seen here at the tip of the arrow is a lacuna, just like we discussed in um, compact bone, lacunae are essentially the chambers inside which the chondrocytes sit in cartilage and they result from the deposition of extracellular matrix all around the cell to the point where the cell can no longer move um, and has to be nourished in the case of cartilage by uh, nutrients and oxygen diffusing uh, through this extracellular material to the chondrocytes in order to keep them alive. Uh, the unfortunate fact though is that we're born with all the cartilage we're ever going to have uh, particularly our articular cartilage, and as we age, the cartilage begins to die and wear down. And when this happens inside joints, eventually we end up with bone on bone in areas like the knee and the elbow, the hip and the ankle. And this is a condition known as osteoarthritis. This eventually results in bone spurs, which result in inflammation and pain. And um, it's going to happen to all of us if we live long enough. And this is just the the age-related degeneration of joint tissue. Um, we want to distinguish that from another type of arthritis called rheumatoid arthritis, which is an 
autoimmune disorder that results from the uh, immune system attacking the joint tissue inside the body, causing inflammation and pain. Um, this condition is treated with anti-inflammatories and immune suppressants. Uh, osteoarthritis, there really isn't an effective treatment for. Um, you just uh, basically have to live with the degeneration of cartilage. Um, if you keep your weight to a minimum, you will slow the progression of osteoarthritis um, for obvious reasons, right? The more weight that you bear on those joints, the more rapidly the cartilage wears away. But other than that, this is something that's eventually going to happen uh, to all of us. Another important aspect of cartilage as a tissue is that it actually serves during human development as the, uh, the second in a series of three skeletal systems. Uh, our first skeletal system is actually a, a fluid-filled chamber called a, a hydrocele that exists when we are a fluid-filled ball called a blastula very early in development as we float in the, uh, in the uterine fluid, the uterine secretions prior to implantation. Shortly after that though, um, the chondrocytes begin to develop a cartilaginous skeleton that uh, contains essentially most of the components that we would recognize in an adult skeletal system except that they're made from a different material. And then uh, as we continue to develop, that cartilage is replaced by calcified bone in a process called osteogenesis. Um, and that is our third and final uh, skeletal system. Uh, the interesting thing about this progression is that it seems to follow the progression of skeletal systems during the evolutionary time on this planet. Um, some of the first skeletal systems were hydroskeletons, such as you might see in a, uh, in a starfish or in a jellyfish. And then the cartilaginous skeleton came along as the, uh, the, the second endoskeleton. Uh, so endoskeleton is where the hard parts are on the inside. And uh, there are still remnants of those groups of animals today when we look at the sharks and the rays in the world's oceans. And then finally, the, uh, the bony skeleton came along with the bony fishes. And uh, that seems to be the latest in evolutionary development of the skeletal system. Um, and I, I should make a note that also um, parallel to that was the development of the exoskeleton, which we see in uh, crustaceans and in insects as a couple of examples, that tissue is made up primarily of a, a material called chitin. Um, but there's a, there's a problem, of course, with an exoskeleton, which is as the organism grows, um, the hard exterior has to be molted in order for the organism to change in size. And uh, during that time, the organism is very vulnerable because it's all soft parts. This is where we get soft-shelled crabs from. And when they molt every year, they're harvested and fried, and I must say that they're uh, quite delicious. Okay, let's move on. What kind of tissue we're looking at here? This is simple columnar epithelium. It's uh, easily recognized by its single row of nuclei at one level, or the fact that it's taller than it is wide or thick. Um, and if you look very closely, you can even see little protrusions on the apical end of the columnar tissue. And those are cilia. Okay, so this is actually simple ciliated columnar epithelium. It's sitting on top of basement membrane here, okay, which is a type of extracellular matrix that serves as a substratum so that the, uh, the tissue stays in place. Um, where is this tissue found in the body? Uh, it's found in, among other places, the lining of the jejunum, which is the, uh, the second portion of the uh, small intestine small intestine is broken up into the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. And what does this um, tissue do? It secretes, it absorbs, it lubricates. Um, it, the secretions include enzymes that help break down uh, the macromolecules in the food that we eat, and mucus that helps to lubricate the food as it moves through the digestive tract. Okay, just a couple of examples. Um, where would the basement membrane in this tissue be located? And it would be found where the blue arrows are indicated. Okay, so you can see that little light line there uh, of tissue. That is extracellular matrix, and that's the substratum to which um, 
this simple columnar epithelia attaches. Okay, this is actually looks like to me the um, a slide of a villus, which is a finger-like projection of tissue that you encounter commonly in the small intestine, and the purpose of it is to increase the surface area uh, in the lumen of that particular organ so that significant amounts of secretion and absorption can take place in a relatively small physical space. Okay, moving on. What type of tissue is indicated by the arrows here? These are goblet cells, and their job is to secrete mucus. And what mucus does is it either lubricates stuff that needs to move through the lumen of the organ, or uh, in the case of the upper respiratory tract, um, it traps particulates, which can then be evacuated from the respiratory system because these cilia are powered by ATP and are constantly propelling the mucus across their surface. And in the case of the upper respiratory system, that mucus eventually makes its way to the mouth where it can either be swallowed or it can be spat out. Okay, uh, moving on. What tissue is indicated by the blue arrows? Um, and again, this is a pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. Uh, how do we know this? If you look at the nuclei in this single layer of cells, it appears to be at different layers, okay, when in fact it's not. Uh, the tissue here is actually a single layer of epithelial tissue, some cells of which are short and some of which are tall, and so it gives the appearance of more than one tissue when it's in fact only one. Um, the, uh, the cilia are indicated by the black arrows, and the basement membrane is indicated by the blue arrows. Uh, you can also see... Um, the red arrow pointing to a goblet cell. Okay, so this is typical tissue you might find in the upper respiratory, in your trach, in your larynx, and so forth. Okay, um, is this tissue stratified? And the answer here is no. It appears stratified, but in fact, it is a single layer of tissue uh, with several jobs. Right, it um, protects the uh, the lumen from disease, it secretes mucus to trap particulates, um, it uh, evacuates the mucus, and it also um, provides a, uh, a passageway for air to move down into the respiratory division of the respiratory system. Okay, uh, this tissue here, okay, this is skeletal muscle tissue, okay. Um, where is this tissue found in the body? It's found attached to skeletal tissue, and that's why it's called skeletal muscle. So it's attached to bones, okay? You find this tissue attached to uh, the arms, the legs, the hips, the chest, the broad muscles in the back, uh, along the, um, the, the aspect, the, the posterior and anterior aspect of the cranium. Um, basically, this is the muscle that we command. We tell it what to do, and it carries out uh, our conscious commands. What functions are performed by this type of tissue? Uh, it helps regulate body temperature. Uh, for instance, when we get cold, we shiver, and that produces heat. That raises our body temperature. It also aids in movement. Okay. Um, what are the uh, types of tissue seen here at the tips of the arrows? These are myocytes, okay, myo meaning muscle, site meaning cell, and what type of protein fibers are seen throughout this tissue. If you look very closely at this tissue, if you go to a very high magnification, what you'll see are striations, and those striations are due to the regular arrangement of two important muscle proteins called actin and myosin, and they have the ability to walk over the top of each other, causing the entire um, muscle cell to shorten under our conscious command, obviously with the use of ATP and uh, creatine phosphate as high energy molecules. They're what drive uh, the, the muscle's power. Okay, So you have to have a lot of ATP, you have to have a lot of mitochondria, you have to have a lot of oxygen in order for skeletal muscle to work um, at its peak. And uh, again, uh, this is one of three types of muscle tissue. Um, two other types that are not pictured here 
They include cardiac muscle tissue, um, which is only found in the heart and is distinguished from skeletal muscle tissue because um, it is highly branched and it also contains special structures called intercalated discs, which feature gap and tight junctions and desmosomes. Uh, the gap junctions are there for electrical communication. The tight junctions and the desmosomes are there for structural support so that the heart doesn't fly apart when it beats. Um, the other type of muscle tissue is smooth muscle tissue. These are spindle-shaped fibers uh, that you can find um, in the walls of organs, in the uh, middle layer of tissue, in blood vessels, and it is under involuntary control. So the autonomic nervous system is the driver of skeletal muscle movement along with, uh, in some cases, um, certain hormones, certain chemical signals. And um, it's primarily concerned with internal movement. Okay, I know it's weird to think of your body moving on the inside as well as on the outside, but it constantly is doing both. Okay, um, moving on. What type of tissue is seen here? This is, again, epithelial tissue. Um, where is this tissue type found in the body? It's found in the lining of the esophagus. Um, what functions are performed uh, by this type of tissue? Um, it, it provides protection. It withstands abrasion. Is it vascular or avascular? This tissue is primarily avascular, particularly the uh, stratified epithelial tissue that you might find on the external surface of the skin as shown here. Okay, This is stratified epithelial tissue from several different places. Um, this is stratified squamous. Okay, Remember that when you designate a name for epithelial tissue, um, the, the stratification takes on the name of the of most superficial layer. So you can see that the upper layer of the stratified tissue is flat tissue. As we head down, uh, we eventually switch over um, into uh, what looks like sort of cuboidal tissue, but uh, because you have many layers of flattened cells, this is considered to be stratified epithelial. Um, it is avascular, and you might think initially that, that this is a, an unfortunate feature of the tissue because you know very well that blood is life, literally, in the human body. The oxygen and nutrients that are provided by the blood help keep tissue alive, and if you're away from your blood supply, you eventually die. And in point of fact, 99% um, of dust is in fact human skin, which is shed daily from our body, but it's constantly regenerated by stem cells that live down in these deeper layers. You can see them here. Okay, And what they do is, as they divide, the cells begin to move um, upward towards the uh, superficial surface. As they do, they lose contact with the blood supply underneath. They lose their nuclei and they eventually die. But this is by design because um, what this does in terms of especially our external covering is protect us against pathogens because they don't get a chance really to set up camp before their, uh, their home is shed. And so this is good that we're constantly um, losing and regenerating new skin um, and uh, obviously this takes a considerable amount, of, considerable amount of energy in order to constantly divide. One of the great mysteries in the body is how it is that stem cells that I'm indicating here manage to remain as a viable population while their, their cell division products uh, seem to move up and out and then eventually die off and the reason for this is that when a stem cell divides, one member of that cell division basically stays home and remains a stem cell, while the other member of that cell division moves away from the, uh, the stem cell population and eventually differentiates and carries out its um, normal function in the human body. And for the longest time, this was a great mystery. How, to, how is it this could be? Because generally, when we think of cells undergoing mitosis, we think that the two products that are produced are identical. And that's not the case in stem cells. So part of the answer to this riddle turns out to be the basement membrane. We think that there are probably special chemical signals embedded in the basement membrane that 
tell the stem cell populations to remain stem cells while the, uh, the daughter cells that lose their contact with the underlying membrane now are allowed to differentiate and carry out their normal adult function. Okay, um, what tissue is seen here? This is areolar connective tissue. You can tell that because there's very few cells and a lot of extracellular stuff. If you look very closely, you can see a lot of fibers uh, running every which way and very few cell and cell nuclei. Where is this tissue type found in the body? It's found in the fascia. It connects skin to muscle. It binds fascicles together. It binds nerves together as well. It cushions and wraps organs. It also holds tissue fluid and it binds tissues to each other. It's sort of like the body's glue. Okay. Um, the type of cell seen at the tip of the arrow is a fibroblast. Okay. A fibroblast makes fibers. Uh, blast means to build and so what this guy does is he creates extracellular matrix and that fulfills the function of this tissue which is to glue other tissue types to each other. Is this tissue, uh, what three types of protein fibers can you find in this tissue? If you look very closely you can see collagen fibers, elastic fibers, and reticular fibers and you should also note that this tissue is relatively avascular, okay? not that many blood vessels in this connective tissue. Okay, next we got some uh, sort of uh, fill-in-the-blank questions. In which of the tissues you observed in lab would you find adipocytes? Uh, you would find them in slides obviously of adipose tissue, but you'd also find them in the epiglottis if you looked very closely. Uh, where would you find chondrocytes? You'd find them in the hyaline cartilage of the trachea. Where would you find osteocytes? In dry ground bone. Goblet cells would be found in the trachea. Um, ciliated cells, pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelia, also in the trachea. And uh, fibrocytes or fibroblasts are found in areolar connective tissue, also known as fascia. Uh, the job of fascia is to uh, seal muscle fascicles to each other. These are bundles of muscle cells that act as a unit. Um, they also serve to attach overlying adipose tissue and uh, skin uh, to the underlying musculature, again serving as the body's glue. Okay? So that's their job. That's why they perform the task they do. Okay. Uh, last thing we've got here are some uh, sort of matching questions. Okay, Where would we find air sacs of the lung? Okay, So we can circle these as we go down. Why don't we do that? We'll do these in uh, red pen. Okay, uh, Air sacs are going to be found down here. I, simple squamous epithelia. Okay. Uh, question number two. The epiglottis is going to feature hyaline cartilage. Okay, so we can draw a line over here. Cartilage right there. Okay. Um, fascia. That's going to be areolar connective tissue. Okay lining of the esophagus and that's going to be stratified squamous epithelia okay lining of the jejunum and that's going to be simple columnar epithelium Okay. Lining of the kidney tubules, that's going to be simple cuboidal epithelium. Lining of the trachea, and that's going to be pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium.
skeletal system is going to be bone. Tendons are going to be dense, regular connective tissue. And trachea is going to be adipose connective tissue. Okay. And I don't know that we showed you any tendon slides. What you should do is Google dense regular and dense irregular connective tissue and uh, you'll be able to pull up some tendon. Okay. All right. And then for the last one, we've got uh, some matching. So watch very closely. I'll give you 20 seconds. Okay, true false. Epithelial tissue is vascular. Um, the answer there is true. Question number two, all connective tissue is avascular. The answer there is false. There's two types, for instance, of liquid connective tissue, blood and lymph. Obviously, they are vascular. Next question, uh, chondrocytes, adipocytes are found in epithelial tissue. The answer there is false. Next question. A fibroblast is an immature fibrocyte. The answer there is true. Okay. Next question. Cilia and microvilli are features of some epithelial cells. That is true. Next question. The mesenchyme cell is an embryonic stem cell of connective tissue. That is true. Next question. Epithelial tissue tends to have less intercellular material, such as liquids, semi-solids and fibers than connective tissue that is true and then the last question basement membrane is a feature of most connective tissues and that is false okay that brings us to the end of this lab test review um, again this is not a substitute for going to lab I highly encourage you to uh, make every effort to attend biosis or to go to your relevant lab section Thank you.